to when we switch off the light. <laughs> okay. So oh, well, we have the pleasure to have uh, tonight uh, Billy Sin and, and, and Todd Williams uh, uh, lecturing for us. Um, as many of you know, they ha are practicing architects based in New York uh, and have, uh, in 1986, co-founded the husband and wife architectural firm, <laughs> uh, Todd Williams, Billy Sin and Associates. Um, uh, together, their practice and their projects have both won numerous awards. Some recent awards for their practice include uh, their IBA fellowship in 2014, University of Florida Design Excellence Design Award in 2014, National Medal of Arts presented by U.S. President Barack Obama in um, 2013, um, AIA Architectural Firm Award 2013, AIA New York President Citation uh, 2013, and both uh, reviewed an induction to the National Academy in 2009. <coughs> they have uh, uh, many prestigious projects with, with also with specific awards to these projects. I want to uh, mention the AIA Institute Honor Award for Architecture in 2015 for their work on the Lefrac Center in Brooklyn. Uh, also another one for the Barnes Center in Philadelphia. Uh, an AIA in New York Architectural Merit uh, Award in, and uh, for their work on the Logan Center for Arts and and for the, uh, another one in, in 2013 for the Center for Advance, Advancement of Public Action and many other. <laughs> Their office first monograph uh, appeared in 2000, if I'm right, uh, titled, uh, and I always insist in the, in the careful meaning and the, uh, of, of the titles, Work Slash Life, Todd Williams, Billy Sien, and a number of subsequent publications have been dedicated to covering their practice, uh, including the 2012 book, The Architecture of the Barnes Foundation, Gallery in a Garden, Garden in a Gallery. <laughs> and they have ta taught um, in extensively uh, in many places and, and with they had the Jane and Bruce Graham Chair in Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania as well as the Ellen Sarin and, uh, Chair at the University of Michigan. Billy has taught uh, at, at Parsons, uh, SciArc, Yale, uh, University of Texas, uh, University of Virginia and here obviously. <laughs> at the Harvard GSD. Uh, Todd and Billy are perennial visitors, uh, in reality, to the GSD, uh, um, uh, who frequent uh, this room to share their work and, and ideas uh, almost every year, almost every two or three years. We are particularly fortunate to welcome them tonight, uh, given the resonance that their work uh, has always maintained with the topic of this semester's uh, symposium on architecture that will be celebrated uh, uh, at the end of April 22, uh, uh, almost the, the last day of the, the, the term, and uh, entitled Interior uh, Matters. And that uh, uh, all, I mean, this, this lecture, as, as the first one on Jack, uh, of, of Jack Sertog and, and one that will come on Toyo Ito's work, uh, I insist in this idea of interior uh, materiality as the main topics of, of the whole uh, semester. No? Today, in architecture, philosophy, many branches of science, and the arts. The topic of materialism is being investigated with newfound passion. In the last decades, concern over formulating new approaches to matter has taken center stage in many fields. There are many um, such approaches uh, that I, I want to mention. For example, the work of, of, of Richard Senet that will be coming to the symposium with a project that he has called Homo Faber, Exploring Material Ways of Making Culture, a series of books in which the Craftsman, um, the 2008, is the first and well-known uh, installation. Also, figures like, uh, well-known, like Bruno Latour, Jane Burnett, and Manuel de Landa are calling attention to the vitality of matter, its ability to do things. Architects, many of whom are here at the GSD, are investigating thermodynamic approaches to architecture and, and matter that try to renew the discussion on, on both issues, interior and matter. I mean, in, the, in disciplines as, ne and as neuroscience, uh, the redescription of the relationship among our body and the m matter and the objects that surround us 
uh, are being like crucial to develop new ideas on, on our relation with the world. I think that the, this was going to be, by the way, uh, titled uh, Inside Out, but you have changed it the, to interiority. It sounds more intellectual. <laughs> well, there are other approaches, the molecular, the phenomenological, uh, which is also reviewing its, uh, its agenda. As, as we, uh, all those of you that assisted to the symposium organized by Silvia Benedito on atmospheres, uh, probably had some some insights on on, on this renovation of the uh, gaze of uh, phenomenology. Among the many reasons reasons for this is, um, explosion of material thinking, I just want to mention. Uh, uh, one is, is this one stands out as particularly decisive, in my opinion, is an increasingly bureaucratic and corporate context that tends to limit degrees of freedom. Uh, the, the main thing that is bringing back this uh, uh, attention to uh, the interior and the materiality, a refreshed focus on material that promises a way out of the corporate models of success. The work of Todd and Billy has been invested in the sensuous capacities of material since before this shift, and in some capacity has prefigured the importance of this issue today. In this sense, the work uh, finds belonging with a larger movement that in, is on course to become one of the central concerns of our disciplines in the present and in probably in the future. So please, join me welcoming once again Billy and Todd. <laughs> All yours. <laughs> so this is great. I kind of feel like we're in a big shower together. It's just like a group shower. It's very nice. Um, That's what you want, huh? What? <laughs> okay. It's in very intimate. Okay. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this, this subject is... Has, uh, it's not just about the fact that we believe that our interiors are more interesting than our exteriors, actually more vital, and actually that deliver our exteriors, uh, that we spend all of our time in our interiors, um, in inside buildings, uh, but we find that it increasingly grows and becomes ever more uh, vibrant even as we begin to decay. Hopefully not immediately. Well, not this evening. But, um... so. <laughs> Yeah, so the, this is a picture that we took a long time ago, and I really liked it because it's a pump house um, that uh, ha is enclosed in that little shack with a, a wind um, turbine on the top, which sort of brings the water up. But it's also like the, the Da Vinci drawing. You know, there's the sort of interior, and then there's the exterior, and both of them are working together. So we're not saying that we only believe everything comes from the interior, but we want to focus on that because that's really where we always begin. We always begin on the inside. Well, the other thing is that this, uh, this also means that the work is site-specific and site-located, that it's, it has a respect for the ground as the, the wind turbine did, as our feet do to the earth, and as the uh, step wells of Ahmedabad uh, so inspired us when we went to first to India about 15 years ago and visited these wells, which had almost no appearance at the surface of the earth, but were used for both washing clothes and, and getting water uh, hundreds of years ago. But unfortunately, the system, the, the, the wells have gone dry, and these are dry spaces. But they're cool spaces in a place that really is very, very hot and very humid. Um, so we are interested in that sort of negative space and going down into the ground as um, our students are unfortunately finding out. So the idea and the importance of section um, is very, very important in the studio that we're taking. And this, of course, is Michael Heiser's piece at Dia Beacon, which is a kind of um, also in the head of the step well. It's the negative space, and it's extremely powerful. Um, its presence is palpable, but you don't see its presence. Well, Michael Heiser's work in the Southwest over these many, many years is really particularly powerful, and it's also completely intimate. It's his own pro pro uh, project. Well, we're, we're architects, and it's not, we're not making art. We're making architecture. Um, uh, John Soane's house is a, you know, a, both a kind of horror to us and also a place of huge fascination because of the intimacy that he uh, created there. 
Well, and also this idea of the collection of objects and how objects are very important. The ones that you surround yourself are very important to defining who you are. I mean, we're architects, we're designers, we're thing people. So things are very important to us. So this, um, of course, anybody who has kids probably or grew up in a certain time knows Goodnight Moon. Um, but I found it very interesting that the color scheme of Goodnight Moon and the Bunny's Room is very similar to the Carpaccio painting um, of St. Jerome um, contemplating um, the death of... It's uh, St. Augustine contemplating the death of St. Jerome. Um, but in both of the rooms, they are surrounded by the things that sort of make up their life. So whether it's the sort of... Um, bowl of porridge by the side or some of the astrological objects that are sitting next to Augustine, those start to define who you are. Even and the comfort of the cat, you know. Uh, we, we don't like to think, <laughs> we don't like to think that we have such things around us. Uh, that's a dog? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, from here it's we, a cat. We don't really have any pets. So. No, we don't. But we have a lot of things around ourselves. And they do, they give us comfort. They give us a sense of location in the world. And I think that's what that's about. Or here, this is Lorenzo Lato. Somehow this is at a time when you're becoming more aware of the person having a, a character in the symbols that were in the, in the St. Jerome. So... They are now also symbols here, but they're more animate. So when you look at this closely, so the art historians are talking about the lizard uh, being a, sign, a kind of sign that this person is not well. Um, they're sort of cold-blooded. And also the sort of fallen petals um, that have come from the flower. So the importance of things um, is something that infuses uh, how we work. We've shown this many times. I haven't seen it for probably 20 years. The, this is the Wharton Eshrick's own home in, in outside of uh, Philadelphia, where he's made this incredible stair of wood that actually goes up and, and has a, a split piece that it heads up to a half landing and a handrail that changes from wood to uh, ivory. ivory. And uh, the sense of touch, the temperature change, is so startling when one although both are equally smooth and sensual, uh, it's the temperature that really surprises one. Yeah, it's so subtle. So when you run your hand down the railing, because the wood is really feathered into the ivory, and then th that warmth of the wood, and then all of a sudden the coolness, although the ivory is very old, so it looks very much like wood, is a very, very powerful um, experience. And uh, I moved into Carnegie Hall in 1972, I found out that architects could live there at low cost and eventually moved up to the very top floor. Uh, and some years later, Billy came to work and live with me. That top floor, uh, so there. we lived there from 1972 to 2008. Um, it was an amazing place. It's kind of a jumble of studios. There were 160, uh, and eventually now there are none. Um, but. It was a very interior experience um, within a very public building. So this is actually an image of what we considered our backyard. Um, and when you went out the door of the landing, you would be uh, there. And you, our son grew up in this building. So you could climb up to the top of the roof. I guess I was somewhat lax mother. And you could um, be up there without any railings um, underneath the water tower. Well, we. we climbed up on the top of the water tower. And when, when uh, Caesar Pelli, Pelli built the, next, the building next door, we climbed into that building as it was going up to the top. Uh, but uh, the, it was a magical place. I mean, the reason I moved there is that I thought it was the center of the universe. And for me, it was, and it still is in many ways. To be right in the middle of something, in the very middle of something, is the most intimate experience one could ever have. So when we found out that we were going to be um, kicked out of the building as they kicked everybody out. Todd did this drawing uh, of the plan of the apartment. Here. Yeah, I'll point out some of the features. You walked up, the, the elevators didn't come up to the level. They stopped a, a level before, below. 
And then walk, one walked up a metal fire stair here, open actually 15 stories below. Uh, that was the door to the terrace that eventually got it. That was uh, our sneakers that we leave outside. Uh, my bike behind the door. Um, this was our studio at one time. In fact, the drawers were for tools, and we had uh, two tables here. But this actually was the table I took from Richard Myers after leaving. It was a it was a door that was painted that became our dining table. Uh, the bathroom that we had a two burner hot plate and a under counter refrigerator and a um, convection oven for those 35 years. Um, our son's room here was the size of. Uh, our son eventually, at first his <laughs> crib. Um, and uh, we, we climbed up a ladder every night to a little uh, balcony that we made that was under a skylight, and it was fantastic. And this became our sort of library or study in the, his room. So it was full of stuff, and, and we've now moved from there to another equally small place that has all of this stuff and more in it. But it's interesting because it felt like a... a it had a huge skylight over the top. In fact, there were two skylights and actually very few, very small windows. So it felt as if you were in a very interior space with light coming down from above. Oh, hold it back. That was his, his crib was in there when he was little. Go back. And those are two little windows and they were exactly on axis of the windows that were opposite. So we didn't really abuse him um, much. Uh, he could look out to the view. But um, so it's not John Stone, but we also surrounded ourselves with all things that were of interest to us, and they were incredibly and are incredibly eclectic. Um, and as Todd said, um, the second skylight, we would climb a ladder and sleep underneath the skylight. So the bed was literally cantilevered out over the space below. Um, <laughs> and from time to time, we would climb out that window, which was difficult as I got older, to the roof. Our son. <laughs> um, he came back for a, a, for a final re shot. return engagement, yeah. yeah. Um, but living in that space for, for such a long time really taught us a lot about how to think about space. Um, that we like to be surrounded by walls, um, that light coming in a certain way has a huge and powerful um, uh, effect on on how you live and that um, things are important. So we moved to a different apartment and um, this is a drawing that Todd did for a handrail. Well, it was based on a, a, a railing, not uh, loosely based on a railing for the, that I saw in the studio at uh, Zadkin Zad Zad Studio in, in Paris, Paris, which was a very, very thin rail and I thought it was wonderful because it just bent as the railing could bend. So. I thought that if you could bend a railing, it would self-stiffen, and uh, did these drawings, which then were followed by a wonderful ironmonger, um, and created these transitions at the corners that would actually self-brace themselves. So in fact, it was supported in very few places, or it is supported in very few places. And uh, But although it doesn't change its temperature um, like the I wood to ivory, um, it is very satisfying because the, the turns give you places to hold on as you sort of walk down the stairs. So we're going to show actually four projects. I'm going to, this is still part of the lead into the four projects, but this is a very early thing that we did as a collaboration with the artist Karsten Holler. And the idea was that everything was being made out of snow and it was done in northern Finland. And those of you who know Holler's work, he works a lot with slides and the idea of movement. And it was our idea that we not have a visible slide, but we have a, a kind of buried slide. So this was a plaster model that we had done um, of the idea where you would slide down through that hole, but then you would walk out through the sort of um, curving paths. So all that needed to be made was a meter high cake of, of snow, which you could get, could happen here. And, uh, and then you'd climb up on that, that table of snow and slide down into the center, actually. Uh, this was done in the Rovaniemi. Yeah. Right. Um, the here the guys were cutting the snow into the, 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 the dish on which the, all you needed also was a hollow that was a little deeper than that meter of snow, so it was actually two meters deep. And you sort of didn't notice it, actually. <laughs> 
I mean, came it, up on it. And actually, this was way before we went to India and saw the step wells. But it was this desire to um, create ex an experience that went down into the ground and had um, a, a very uh, indistinct, sort of almost hidden presence, uh, except here it is at night when the light is on. Um, so now we're going to start to show these four projects. Um, McDowell Colony. Actually, they're very different scale and size. <clears throat> this is in, in uh, Peterborough, New Hampshire, which you may know. McDowell Colony was started in 1907 by Marion uh, McDowell and her husband, who died a couple of years later. But she was a pianist and he was a composer. And uh, they created a, an artist colony, which our architects can go to, but it's often writers and painters that go there and are given a, a dwelling uh, in the woods. There are 25 of them, and you're allowed to stay there for up to two months, I think. Yeah. Uh, you would be you would take your breakfast in a common place, and lunch would be brought to you in your studio, and uh, then you'd have dinner together. So um, the one place besides the dinner where the people had dinner, where people could gather, um, was this little library called Savage Library. And um, it wasn't working for a number of reasons. It, it was built in the 20s, um, yeah. and the door opened directly into the one room. And so. And the one room had a fireplace in it, and that wasn't very good for the books. And so, uh, without a vestibule and without a Without a, with a fireplace and without any thermal barriers. This really was unsatisfactory. But furthermore, as a one-room one library for 26 people in a community, it was fine for having a, you know, a, a discussion in the evening, but it hardly would be really a good place to, for 25 people to find a, a book. So this is a, a very small project for us, but a very special one because we really liked this idea of the McDowell. We went to the site, and here you can see the small library building, and then um, this very large rock, which was nearby. And um, so we decided we would make the addition uh, to the library, thinking about this large rock. So the colony hall is up to the right, and our, our drawing of our addition is down at the bottom. This is a finished drawing. So that's the library to the right. And then this odd little low piece is the addition to the library, which we thought should not challenge the library and should be everything the library was not, uh, which is that it was multiple spaces and a small labyrinth, but it was subservient to the library. So this is a, a drawing where we're trying to work out the plan, and it became a little simpler than this, but it more or less worked, that you would walk slide into, actually, it's a little later, so that's a fireplace, because we couldn't use this fireplace anymore, an outdoor fireplace to triangulate the space. Walking in under the eaves into a small vestibule, there's a librarian there when she's there. She has a little room behind her, and there are a couple of rooms for video here. A small step-down living room in through here and other spaces to study in a little place where two or three people could look at a, a screening of something and a couple of seats in the side and two toilets and because uh, there weren't any toilets in the incline and a kitchen and a gallery. So it's a super small building. We also then renovated this which we're really not going to show it. So, so the building uh, bent itself around that large rock, which is very, very beautiful rock. Yeah, this, and then this, this idea rock. of the fireplace being the hearth that moves to the outside was very important to us. And um, we were talking today about flat roof buildings, and we haven't actually done that many buildings with pitched roofs. So. This was also trying to learn a little bit more about how to pitch a roof because it is New Hampshire and there was a huge amount of snow. Well, they, they didn't like the, as we talked with the builder, and it was the one guy who's already building these little buildings and repairing them, we had to make sure the eaves didn't allow the snow to fall off and the ice to fall off and then fall against the window. So this is the, the plan that was ultimately made. So it is um, the we building. We worked with Gary Hildebrand, by the way, yeah. in creating the landscaper. Uh, kind and of using paths. pieces from the land to help to lock the fireplace in and uh, create a kind of a, a soft landscape that uh, removed some of the deciduous, uh, the evergreens and, and made way for some of the hardwoods. So it's a, it's a quiet little building um, which tries to both 
be present, but also not foreground itself. I think really the foreground, and here you can see the connection through to the old Savage Library, foreground element is, is the hearth which has been pulled forward into well, the, the landscape. the fireplace is a little out of scale, but it actually then works pretty well as a counterpoint. It's really the largest, tallest piece in the land. So it's kind of place to which one walks, the rock is just behind it, and then the, our building is lower than the library. Inside is, is wood, the structure runs right down, sort of structural spline that runs right down through the center to help to support the eave, which is pitched. And then we cantilever lights off that piece. But it's really a, almost a, a it's, um, we we're talking today um, about a space being a series of experiences. So this is a series of places to sit and either be by yourself or be with That's other people. That's a nice little place to sit. You just, it seems a little narrow, but it's, I know it's comfortable. This, this you pull a curtain and slide a door closed and then look at this, at a screen that's all over here. And of course, the, the artists that are there are screenwriters and composers, and so things don't necessarily fit on shelves in a normal way. Now this is just after the landscape went in. There are all sorts of ferns outside that have grown. Um, this second project is, is slightly larger, and um, it's two uh, residence halls at Haverford College. And we were talking about um, how you can make what you do ordinary so that at certain points it can become, be extraordinary, and the balance of the ordinary and the extraordinary. So in many ways, these are two extremely ordinary buildings. Well, we, this is our third set of dorms. Our very first one was at Princeton, and was, I think, wanted to be strong, and probably was too strong, a small tower. And then the next ones were at the University of Virginia, which were too big in a way, but were, we saw as walls in the land, and now this one really wants to be completely subservient to the land. So it is in the place of a parking lot that existed. And the parking lot was relatively level and had been built with asphalt. With, and they'd thrown debris below the, the parking lot, all sorts of stuff that wasn't really useful for reuse. And what we did is we took that debris and repacked it and, and created a mound that then allowed us to have two buildings that were Actually, this building is identical to this one, or virtually so, and that were two one-story buildings that had no interior stairs and used the landscape for egress and the landscape as to commune. So that this in Haverford College is an arboretum. And so we said, well, the arboretum is the living room. And then we placed our buildings that were identical on either side of this berm. And inside each of them has a courtyard. And it's a very different kind of plan than what they expected. Every student at Haverford, this is the, the, the reconfigured berm, and it's expected in the relatively near future we might or someone might build some more buildings here. Um, the land slopes, this is our analysis, actually. Um, Karen Timberlake did an analysis uh, of the what they might do, and which is more or less what everyone does, which is to and make we, a double-loaded corridor. Too. I mean, we did that at We UVA. did it at UVA. It's pathetic, but I mean, sorry. It has, has two stairs, has an elevator, has a living element down at, the, at one end and services. And we looked at this and said, if you actually would expand that corridor, you could get the same number of rooms, and you would then have I interesting communities with more connections to the outside. This becomes the courtyard. And so if you look at it, the 10,000 square feet of space has in this case, 700 feet of perimeter, in this case, 570. But the common space here is 3,560 square feet, and here it's 2,950. So it's an unexpected payoff, and it enabled, since we had no stairs, no elevators, we were able to build higher quality at lower cost, which um, to me makes this a small revolutionary building. The students each wanted singles, which made our life more difficult because that meant more rooms. But we also designed very simple furniture for them that they could configure in a variety of ways and had it built in Long Island City. 
It's very sturdy. Furniture. But essentially, the furniture, it's not that the furniture is any in any way revolutionary because it is very straightforward, but the rooms are figured so that the furniture can be arranged in a multiple of ways. And the horizontal mullion of the window is set so that when you're either sitting at a desk or lying in a bed, it is at the right place. So it's not... Well, it's a, we made a mock-up, and the students told us where to put the windows. Right. You know... But it's it, so it's pretty much what they said to do. But it's you know. just a thoughtful way of making a space so that um, kids can rearrange their rooms. So these are drawings of stairways that take you, uh, inclined walks take you to the top of the berm. So they're landscape elements, nothing, no stair required. There are stairs, and then you actually cut through the berm to visit your friends on the other side. Early sketches of how we thought that might be, and then. This is the way it looks today. Uh, you know, it's a stairway and it's a place to sit. Um, this person is walking horizontally along that double, that two-story building, and these people are walking up at a one in twenty incline. And then the, we retain that with a low wall you could sit on, uh, and then you can walk between the buildings and across a bridge, just by virtue of just a very slight torque in the land. That enabled us to use these bricks, the Peterson bricks, and, and, and uh, the same Duratherm windows we'd used before, um, and build at, at uh, actually came in under the budget they had. Then we created a courtyard on the inside with the same bricks in a lighter color that becomes the kind of glue uh, for the, and then we put a wall in the middle of the courtyard so that it would create additional complexity. But it's uh, kind of box of light because the outside is so dark. Uh, and we've been working both with Heath Tile in Sausalito and with a, 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 f a commercial felt company called Liora Manet, which uh, allows us to design felt wall coverings and use as a kind of baseboard um, the Heath Tile. And so these are we used in the hallways and then designed various patterns um, with different colors to try to identify the hallways because basically the two buildings are exactly alike and the first floor and the second floor are exactly alike. So we're trying to bring some sense of richness into something that is actually very ordinary. So, you know, actually this is a skylight that carries light from the roof down to the lower level here. We're able to then make all the floors of, of oak and the door jams of, of uh, wood. The, the rooms, the kids' rooms are sheetrock, but the public hallways are all of durable materials. And then the social spaces, um, we had a little bit more budget so we could give them um, also Heath tile on the walls and bring color in in a very, very durable way. So this is the lower level of the courtyard and then a study space. It then cantilevers out, or basically both set on top of one another. And then... So this was exciting for us to, and I'm happy to say that the kids have now been using them for three years and they seem to be in perfect condition. So if you do something that the kids like, they take care of it. One thing, they, this is quite a lie though, that they keep their shades closed, it seems to me, but um, too much. I think I, we required them to pick them up here. Um, okay, the, the next project, and both of those previous ones are trying to be Quiet in the land, this one is too. These are skating rinks in Prospect Park. We started this project in 2007 and made a building that was too big and we ultimately couldn't afford it. But um, this is built now and it's in its third year of operation. This is a, an oval rink that connects to a, a, an ice skating rink that's the same size as the old Boston Garden. And this is a landscape and there's a two 30,000 square foot buildings that sit below the land here and our address, this is a green roof, and uh, a restoration of 26 acres of the park. So all the way down to here. One of the things that we're, we're really proud about is that it's a very, very democratic building because parks and libraries are really the most democratic places that we have. Um, and that this pathway takes you up on top of the building and you cross over a bridge and you can go down another pathway on top of the other building. And you actually often, people don't ever know they're on top of a building. So it has, it's a building that has tried to sort of in a way hunker itself down into the park. And um, it has a powerful presence, but not in a, a kind of conventional way. Let's go back. 
So there are a couple of other things. First, it's true that we've, re we've reorganized horse paths around here and paths that go up. This is a mechanical aperture that's nearly the size of this port, half of this room that allows the mechanical to exhaust to the air. We've, this is just after it was planted, but some of the planting soil is, you know, three and four or five feet deep so that large trees can grow and will grow. So we worked with a landscape architect, Christian Zimmerman, who is part of the um, Prospect Park Alliance on this. So it's, this is interesting. Olmsted and Vox designed Central Park in 1857, 840 acres. And we, since we live there, we think that's the best thing there is. And it is fantastic because of the way it's cut into the, the, the city Prospect Park, which is a, often and up until recently a sort of second citizen. It's smaller, 585 acres. Uh, done 10 years later, but they, Olmsted and Vox thought they did a better job there because they have a mile and a quarter of open space, they have a much larger forested area, and they have a much larger artificial uh, lake. This is our site, which is up in this corner of the, the park, basically. It's an area which, this is it under construction. Um, it's the most popular slash populist portion of the site because it was, and it was always intended to be that. Um, so in the past, um, when the lake froze, people would actually uh, skate on Prospect Lake. Um, and in the Olmsted and Vox drawings, they show a carriage turnaround concourse, and then something that they called Music Island and a kind of esplanade around the edge. So the idea was that musicians would go play music, and then the- it Would be on the island playing music to the throngs that would be- would be the, sitting there. And then boats would be launched out into the water. It would be a grand time, and the horses would stop here. This is called, a, I think it's called the Chinese Pavilion, right? Like Oriental. Oriental, excuse me. Um, but, but, uh, but, Ro uh, but Robert Moses in the 60s, 1961, destroyed Music Island and created a rink because the, the, he felt that that was what was needed and people wanted it. And the rink was a very inefficient rink. But then he turned the, the carriage turnaround into a 300 car parking lot and basically destroyed all of the detail. Um, so we worked with Christian Zimmerman and the Prospect Park Alliance to restore the edge of the water, Music Island and the Esplanade, and then used what was the big parking lot as the site for uh, the skating rink. So in both these cases, we just took a parking lot and then replaced it with this. So we've got cafe and party rooms. 50% of the restrooms for all of the Prospect Park are here. Um, large mechanical space, that's the aperture. Many of the utility vehicles that are used in the park are parked here. Offices for the running of this whole operation, which is the summer and winter operation. So it's roller skating or water play fountain and hockey. Uh, eventually just covered it with a single, very, very large roof. Um, actually, which was made of steel columns clad in stone, but with <laughs> bar joists that just spanned this and a ring beam so that one could cantilever, well this is a very big cantilever as you can see, uh, opening the corners uh, by the virtue of the power of the ring beam so that the corners are released and the space flows through. But they, um, many of the, because it was a, a parking lot, um, so the original, many of the original trees that were planted by Olmsted and Vox um, exist around the edges. So this is one of the original trees that was planted. So um, from the sort of kind of lake side, it, you can see it as a pavilion. But when you enter it from the park side, it is quite invisible. So this is actually a construction shot that shows um, the earth that was put on top of a building um, to hide the building. And so as you approach the building, you really only see the roof hovering. And then this is also a construction shot standing on top of the building before the earth and the, and the hardscape actually covers the roof of that building. Uh, as with McDowell, we used, went up to Canada and we used a very, very simple way of getting these large stones, which is to see that they do curbing up in Canada and they do it by guillotine and the, the, it then cracks the stone 
and gives a very, very irregular surface, but it also keeps the cost down. So these are actually three and four inch thick slabs of stone there. You can see they're tipped up against a concrete wall in this case with a, a membrane on it. But that concrete wall is the retaining wall that holds the earth, that hides the buildings. So this is now one in 20 down and one in 20 up. Um, just let, let the normal park fixtures run through here. And then this is a view from the top of the two buildings looking down. Uh, but we really wanted the building itself to feel as if it were part of the wall language of central of Central Park or Prospect Park. So it's the sort of that rustic walking through rusticated walls. So, yeah, and once again, a heath tile mural. Which is this idea of moving from a kind of winter to spring, passing along that mural and then the underside of the roof, which um, was very roughly based on the figures that figure skaters used to be. That figure skaters um, were judged by the sort of marks that they cut in the ice when they were doing their um, um, very particular sort of maneuvers. And so that translated to the marks in the ceiling. Which actually are carved into an ephus, a crappy ephus ceiling. Um, but then are, the, the channels are this big. We thought about putting lights in them, but we couldn't afford it. So it's basically the reflection of the lights off the ice or the concrete that, and the silver paint of those channels that makes it look like they're illuminated. It worked quite well. Uh, so in the summertime, it's roller skating, and they do films here, and uh, the water play has been very, very successful um, happily. Yeah, the two rinks sometimes are connected and sometimes are are separate. Um, so that's a, that's a third of the three projects. And the interior aspect, the interiority, is finding a place in the land. And I think that was what we were trying to do in both cases. And we're doing it once again in this project in India. Um, and we I'd say we try to do it in every project we work on. So interiority is not just the texture of the interior of our lives, but it's also the sense of place in the land. And that's why. We strongly believe that we allow ourselves to be given away to the project at hand, that there's no problem with having a pitched roof in New Hampshire or a flat roof in, in, in Prospect Park or working in India and then trying to actually feel like you should be working in India. So we've been working on this now for um, 13 About, years, yeah. 12, 12 or 13 years. It has 2,000 people in it. They've just finished another wing of the building. They seem to work very, very slowly here. A courtyard. This is a courtyard you will see in another courtyard here, and then there's um, a large dining room and and a thousand person auditorium. But this is the north south highway that joins uh, Mumbai eventually to Ahmedabad and the Hutments, and now the towers that exist in the Hutments. So this was probably photographed about three years ago. Our idea was to see if we could leave every tree on the on the land. This was a a place where there were. Uh, factories, and the factories had trees all around them, and there were a couple of older buildings. And we've, working with Brenda Samaya and a local arch a landscape architect, we saved the buildings and tried to work with the land again. So this is the form of the drawings we showed to Ratan Tata. It's changed since then. Uh, this was an auditorium, much smaller auditorium and a dining facility. This more, more, form more or less exists. This doesn't exist, early sketch. But um, the land slopes up, so it's lower here and higher here. Thir and nearly 30 feet difference. Are keeping the ground floor always at the same level. So the buildings, as they move back it, towards the site, uh, are more and more buried in the earth. And they plow into the land because there are a couple of other small homes that are part of the campus that are back in here. Uh, we said that they should put, this is the model that we made, uh, actually a more recent version of the model showing the 1,000-person auditorium. This wing is now built. We have 600 cars parked below grade. Uh, we have a whole mechanical plant here, and it's a pretty good system for, you know, saving water and um, I'd say a very sustainable place. Uh, left the trees where we could. We, Covering the, from the sun and from the, the, uh, 
the heat and the rain of monsoons is really crucial. So everywhere you walk, you're undercover. Uh, once again, we wanted the buildings to be less than the land, so nothing is more than three stories tall. And uh, this is a um, an entry um, sort of canopy. Um, and one of the things we were interested in doing, because it's such a material culture, is trying to think about the things that happen there that are made there um, and how we might use them. So this is all clad in China tile mosaic, which is very much a living tradition. So it's... Well, it's it was, a belt and suspenders oops. roof because we used a, a rubber Sorry. membrane and not brick bat totally and, and, and uh, tile on top of it, which is the way they used to do it. But we insisted that there be a rubber membrane and then the brick bat and then the, uh, the tile. Well, and it's very interesting because it's, um, it's a skill that's practiced primarily by women and they're from a certain village. So uh, all these women know each other and they work together and they come and they live on the site and they tile really sitting down around themselves and then they join the circle. So when they're finished, you can see actually the circle where people are sitting um, joined together by the sort of inter with the intermediate tiles. Well, this is, a, it's, it's all white so it'll reflect the light, but one day I think there'll be solar panels here. Um, so there's an entry um, area that is, has a very long bridge that connects the buildings at an upper level. Here, here's the landscape work that we did largely ourselves, not physically building it, but rather designing <laughs> it ourselves. The fact is it's very, very labor intensive, but our idea was once again that you would cut channels through a sloping <clears throat> landscape and leave the trees at the level that they were. So and then here we also use these uh, these stone jollies that are carved on each side. Uh, when we started the project, it was all done by hand, and now these things are done in part by hand and part by machine. They're, They're still always pretty finished amazing. by hand. Well, it's a, it's a doper stone. It comes out of the ground soft like any stone does and gets harder, particularly a limestone-based st stone with, as it uh, oxidizes. So here you can see those sort of channels that are cut into the ground and um, the trees at their original level. But as Todd said, we, as the buildings move and the land moves up, there are uh, very big retaining walls that are there both to um, allow the buildings to exist at one continuous level, but also to bring some sense of shade um, and also to keep the buildings dry. In this whole complex, there are only two elevators but the fire stairs are all open and they become breezeways by which breezes flow, flow through this. So although portions of the building are air conditioned, here's, here we are at the base of the buildings which are all at one level and people can walk between the channel, that, the retaining channel and the trees. And in a way we did that because we wanted the feet of the buildings to stay dry. One time we were there, there were 36 inches of rain in a single day, which is, well, a lot. Um, so here we see the trees in their landscape at that level. The, the ground hasn't been planted yet. It's just been planted in this one. Um, none of the windows require shades. Maybe a few of them do where we screwed up, but largely because the, the, uh, these sun shades protect them. So the land is rising, um, but the built form stays at that same level. And this canopy of trees, so these are the paths that connect, that are the reddish paths are all of the non-air conditioned spaces. If you leave your air conditioned space, you go out to have food or you go to the bathroom or you go to visit a friend and there's a huge amount of non-conditioned space. So really all the circulation and all of the um, social spaces are under cover um, with fans outdoors. And we design the furniture and then these are some of those spaces where you're convening from floor to floor sometimes walking straight out into the land and you see that there are large windows that are for the workstations um, we the ceilings are made of reclaimed uh, teak. teak that come from go downs and these are uh, we call them candles that we were easily made in in India and you put a light at the bottom or at the top it creates a kind of wonderful but the quality. air blows through across and then with fans it moves the air so it becomes actually a quite comfortable place really in all seasons 
So the workspaces are configured around an interior courtyard. That interior courtyard has um, fountains and um, two oculi, which drop light down so on the, the fountains. So the idea with a little bit of, of water here coming down over stone and shaded, it allows convection to occur. Unfortunately, as I think about this, is not the best idea, but <laughs> because you're using water, which is not the best, but it, it then essentially the the cool air drops and the warm air exhausts out of the top. Um, and it really does work. It's just that it's not the best way to conserve water. Um, and then these are um, co women's cooperatives that are weaving. We took a, a, a t traditional ecot pattern, which is a, a pattern that's woven by actually pre-dyeing the threads before you put them on the loom. And these were the threads were pre-dyed and then sent to women in different villages so they could do the weaving. And um, it's simply taking a standard pattern and making it very large. So these were used, um, they were probably... 30 feet long, yeah, five or six feet tall, and they are all different. Um, so they give a character to the workstations. And so here you can see that there's a lot of glass, but the sun never strikes it, so... Um, you don't ever need shades, and you always feel you can step outside into a comfortable environment. There's much more to say about this project, but we'll sort of leave it at this. It's about these are, obviously we've learned a great deal from the step wells and from building into the earth and feeling the shade of the buildings themselves fire stairs there on the right-hand side. So we en we're ending just with these two small pieces that we made. Well, this was 1983. Uh, going to Rome in 1983 for my first time and spent some months there, I began to feel that I wanted to make buildings that were heavy and I wanted to sense this sort of, have a sense of the interior, uh, the intimacy of the things, the common things we thought saw and had around us, the cardboard, the uh, the blood oranges that one would eat in the springtime. They are plaster casts, and this is a drawing by Billy at about the same time, actually earlier. Um, so before um, Columbus Circle was actually, uh, beca became what it is today with the statue of Christopher Columbus, there was an ideas competition about what to do with Columbus Circle. And I grew up at a time when there was no connection between China and the United States. So I never met my grandmother um, during my entire adult life or even any relatives. You couldn't even mail a letter. So I thought, well, what better way to commemor commemorate Columbus than to give him a very direct way to get to China? <laughs> so... Um, that was my was idea. Was the idea that he was just going to fall right through the, okay. <laughs> and come out on the other side? But I think both of these are um, well. They're signals of our interest. I think of the continuing interest we have in intimacy, and of uh, building into the earth, and uh, and in a way, not being afraid to allow the ingredients of a particular place to. Um, be overwhelmed by preconceptions that we might bring. Clearly, we bring preconceptions, but our idea is to use projects to continue to grow and to change. Well, to lose yourself and to find yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don't run. Come, come here, <laughs> please. <laughs> I am. Um, we have time to to make some questions. I would like to make a comment, and 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 then I will open to. I'm 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 curious about uh, how. I mean, you, you speak about what you do, but this is in. I think it's as interesting as what you do is is how do you do it, and how much the, there is a kind of close relationship among one and the other. Aspects, and I'm 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 wondering if you can uh, speak a little bit about the design processes that you uh, use, because I think that there is a kind of, and for me there is a kind of um, difficulty in understanding how do you survive in 
in a, a country where speed is the main issue and you have to run and you have to be have the idea in minutes and, and deliver the renderings in seconds and, and construct in, I don't know. So I think that uh, it's about interior, this, this lesson or this lecture is about interior, but it's also about speed uh, in a way and, and, and the relationship among intimacy and interior, which I mean etymologically have a kind of relationship, but I would like you to, to extend a little bit on these concepts. Mm -hmm. and how do you work? It's always difficult to explain yeah, how do you work. Yeah, <laughs> Billy, go for it. <laughs> Billy, please. <laughs> That's a easy way out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, we, we wrote a number of years ago about slowness and about how important it was to us. And certainly it's easier to be slower when you're younger and you have less work. Um, but it is still important to us. And so part of what we've done, and Todd says that this is how one can start to define oneself. Sometimes it's easier to know what you don't want to do than to know what it is that you want to do. So slowly by taking jobs and finding out that it was what we didn't want to do, we were able to determine what it is that we want to do. And um, so what we want to do is work for um, institutions, and usually they're nonprofit, which is why tomorrow we're going to do the dog and pony show for a project at Dartmouth, where we're always trying to raise money. Um, but working for institutions puts you on a slower schedule than um, working, doing commercial work. You know, it's people's choices. So we're not saying that one thing is right and the other thing is wrong, but what we're saying is we've learned by doing things that we didn't like what we sort of ended up liking doing. So by that choice of work, our work is on a slower schedule. Um, and we also stay relative, we, we don't, haven't really grown. So... It's not true. Well, we've grown since 1986, okay. but well, we yeah, stay we, relatively yeah. stable as, yeah. a, as a size of space. Um, we didn't show our studio, but our studio is about two blocks from Carnegie Hall, and um, we'll, we won't leave that space, and so that space sort of contains us. And that also means that you only take on a certain number of projects. So well, we, like to, we, we like to work together. I mean, I, I'm not the... If, I mean, I think this balance is... <laughs> I like to work with you. In fact, I insist on it. I don't think I could do it alone. And I, I, don't, I don't think, think I could I, teach alone. Yeah. I, I mean, we just are very, have different things we bring. I think I bring a great practicality to everything. I think, oh. oh. <laughs> that is the truth. Tell me. I, I think... I can't believe you said that. <laughs> Well, no, I, I actually think you're quite. I think you. Shit, no, 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 no. I think you're quite the dreamer. I think you're actually quite the dreamer, and I think I'm the sort of more Chinese practical person. At any rate, we shift roles, obviously, and sometimes it's called trans architects. No, um, the I, I think that no, I, I like to say I'm practical because I I do think of all of those buildings are well, they have to be built right, and you have to figure out how to build them. There's no. I like to think that we, I could sort of understand how you build it, even if I'm not going to build it ourselves. Well, that, and, and I'm sorry, I take that back about the practical part, because you, you do want everything to work. So yeah. people in our studio, the first question is loading. I mean, yeah, in our studio here, yeah. Everyone's um, got to work on the, their loading dock. I'm sorry. Where does the garbage go? Yeah, and I know I, I get my self too deeply into that stuff and so and I think that Billy steps back and usually makes these like you know impressive observations that change the course of our work <laughs> uh, and sort of settle it in slightly a different way I'm usually complaining all the way but I usually often accept that she likes things to be serene and uh, so we got to do that you know well I think the way we can work together is that we're very different so I think by not being the same, we can sort of knit together. I think if we were more the same, we'd probably have bigger fights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, 
That's sort of it. Yeah. I mean, I'm more three-dimensional person. Billy's more two-dimensional. <laughs> I mean, no, no, I think Billy's more a painter. She, no, she's more a painter. No, no, I just, I can sort of figure out how things go together, and she's more, and she's a painter, I think. That's a big difference. No? Yeah. Yeah. She... <laughs> Agreed to find out. <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> Let's go to other uh, questions, please. <laughs> Sorry about that. Less personal? <laughs> yeah, okay. Less personal. Uh, hi. Um, so thank you very much for the lecture. And uh, I was wondering, with, um, with so much thought that you put into the interiority of your projects, I'm curious to know more about the um, uh, threshold and how you sort of draw this boundary of what it is, of the interiority of your projects, and, if, um, and what sorts of questions you ask yourself mm -hmm. during the design process mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. apertures or mm -hmm. a more elongated kind of experiential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some. One of the things I think is um, the idea of threshold extends beyond the threshold. So um, it doesn't happen with everything that we saw here, but a lot of what we do with our projects is we break, break the project into other pieces. And so then it's a space between um, the, the solids that is also the architecture. So the threshold doesn't just become uh, the door through which you walk. The threshold is the place between the buildings that we yeah, make. That's right. I mean, that's a perfect example. The fireplace is a threshold to the complex. The uh, uh, the, uh, the walls and the land, which are not always orthogonal, uh, become thresholds to the buildings. Um, and then I would say there, it's always critical, at least for me, to have a sense of, of light when I'm walking down someplace. I can't stand to not have light at the end of a hall, and I don't want to necessarily see it all, but I'd rather see it around a corner. And so I want to always be curious about how to go around the next corner. And then there's the issue of weight, which is really important, because I don't think that the weight of the building drives it into the ground and allows us to have mass. So we're constantly thinking about how thick walls can be rather than how thin they can be. Um, and that body of the building then provides a threshold between inside and outside. And, and, the, and the importance of solid walls. I mean, yeah. I think the idea of aperture is important to us, but it's a very controlled aperture because then what you see becomes much more important to you than if you see everything. So in the Carnegie Hall apartment, the aperture was primarily to the sky, and then the actual windows that were in that apartment were about this big, and there weren't many of them, and they were close to the floor, but you really always you know, looked because you were looking through something solid. Well, Kai could look out through the foot of yeah, his bed, like... and he could look out through these two things, and they were intimate to him. Another, um, I was going to say something. But you can use it for the next question. Mm, okay. <laughs> Thank you. It was, it was the final brilliant thing I was going to say. <laughs> Another question? Yeah, this is here. So, uh, can you wait? So, uh, given the uh, stark difference in the working styles and the overall perception of architecture in India, how was your experience of working there? And like, what were the challenges? Oh, in, in India? Yeah. Oh my God. Well, um, I, <laughs> well. <laughs> I think it was very, it was very interesting because um, the. Because a lot of things happened through mock-ups, very, very big building mock-ups. And so large sections of um, walls or even parts of buildings were built, and then they were taken down and rebuilt. So it was very much about a physical understanding things through physical language, not necessarily understanding things through drawings or details. Well, mock-ups are always important in our work, but even more so there, and there of course, labor is low. And uh, I also think that, that the, uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy, which is why this project has taken so long. That's extremely frustrating to us. Um, but I would say the ability for people to do amazing things with their hands is a dream. And I would say that the overall experience was simply life-changing. And, and that I mean, it was a kind of gift that I could never imagine. Just a gift, period. Still is. 
Um, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to listen to, to, to listen to you. Um, toward the end of your talk, I find myself, when you're talking about landscape and, and building into the land, I, I suddenly started thinking about Frank Lloyd Wright. And, and then I thought later uh, about the significance of the hearth, for example. Um, what do you make of that um, observation, well, I, if, if, well, any, I, if anything? <laughs> well, no, look, I... I was taught not to like Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> and I was told not to like Alto and Kahn. <laughs> I was told to like Peter Eisman and Richard Meyer and some other people. Um, and eventually, I, you find that you like that stuff. And you, um, <laughs> you know, we were just out at Taliesin and yeah, the we crappy Taliesin little West. things that he has out in his, the sun, what is it called, the sun cabin. Um, just the same kind of crap we have around. He's found stuff and it's kind of layers and textures. But we don't try to follow that stuff slavishly. It's just that it is a, a pleasure to have it come into our lives so late on. <laughs> you, know, you know, that didn't come into my life until I was capable of dumping my teachers and well, finding our own voice through the work slowly. I mean, certainly the thing that was very interesting about being at Taliesin, and you know, people always say that the buildings are so tiny, which they are, and Todd hit his head a number of times, but um, <laughs> is, the, is the issue of scale yeah. and detail. And um, I think, you know, we, in our earlier writing, we said, well, you know, we mourn the loss of the hand. And you can see we're still drawing by hand, but certainly we're practicing. And so we're using the computer a lot. But I think one of the things that's important in the education of architects today is really understanding scale. Because when you're looking at a Frank, when you're in a Frank Lloyd Wright building, you know, the scale, like how, how low is the coffee table? What is the kitchen counter height? All those things are very, very thoughtful. And so when I'm standing there, there's a little mirror that's part of the decoration, and I see myself in the little mirror. This was in the Frank Lloyd Wright house. And so I think that it's hard to understand scale when you're working in scaleless space. And so I think one of the things I hope that we accomplish with our students in our studio is to have them really grapple with scale and how big things are supposed to be so that you don't draw a table that's 15 feet across because it looks good in the room that you made and it's the right proportion, but then when you actually measure it, you realize you could never have a conversation across it. Another thing I, I wanted to uh, say, maybe not directly to your question, is is uh, everyone says, oh, gee, you, build, you must have huge budgets. Well, we the budgets are not super low, but they are not so high. We're constantly strategizing on how we can maximize the material that we use, the place where we go. In, in, in uh, McDowell Colony, we were told that the guy who made all of those weird little buildings was the guy we're going to build with. And he was a real ornery guy and didn't want to hear about architecture. And we had to slowly make a, an agreement where he was an equal partner to us. Um, and I think that that happens, and we do that. We see materials as an equal partner to us. We, we sort of learn from them as we go along. I just want to add to this that uh, this, these ideas that you are mentioning, uh, in a lot, or almost all the projects you, you do, you, you use fragmentation. Uh, I mean, paradoxically, you fragment the volumes to create interiors. I mean, it, yeah. and, and, and I think that this is always creating a kind of sense of a small scale mm -hmm. in, 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 and there's a kind of attempt to, to really not, I mean, the, the first approach you make when you have a program is to put all together and see how big it is. No? Mm -hmm. um, it seems that you are doing exactly the opposite. You slice it in pieces and try to organize it in, in other places, in yeah, other yeah. ways. No? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, yeah. so, more questions? Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me.